My next guest is an adventurer and reptile conservationist. He has some incredible stories today on the podcast and today we talk quite a lot about his amazing expedition down in Guyana where he was out in the Amazon rainforest for one month looking and studying reptiles and specifically snakes. On the podcast today we talk about snakes and how he wants to sort of change people's perceptions and make sure that snakes and humans can coexist in the future. So I am delighted to introduce Harrison Carter to the podcast. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, it's really nice to kind of get on and have a chance to talk about the journey, um, something that for me has been quite a long time in the making. So nice to have a quick chit chat. Well, it sounds like quite an incredible journey. You are a reptile conservationist and adventurer and a couple of years back you were out in Guyana in the jungle doing this incredible trip uh, before we get into that specific trip let's talk about how because most people especially when I sort of look found you and looked at your Instagram and saw the huge amount of pictures with you and snakes would probably freak most people out but for you, this is what you love to do. And so how did it all start? You know, that's the, I think that's the question that everyone who works in snakes gets asked first, <laughs> like, how did you get started in this? Or what's wrong with you? Or both? Um, <laughs> I think, I think for me, growing up always around wildlife in the countryside and Suffolk, I knew that animals were going to play a really huge part in my life. Um, but I've always been attracted to different things. Um, and for me, that was scales. I think, you know, snakes particularly interesting for me. I I still find it fascinating that, you know, something with no ears, no arms, no legs can be so deadly and so effective at kind of killing things. I mean, they're obviously really pretty. I think that snakes are actually a, a huge animal taboo um, in, in kind of societies we have it now. I mean, they're embedded in like our social language snake you know someone is a snake or whatever it's it's a, you know common um discussion point equally they're on all like loads of our fashion clothes the latest gucci range features snakes all over it. it's the thing that is all around us divides opinion um and i'm not i'm not sure we talk about them enough um and for other reasons that we can go on to later that they're, they're also having a real significant impact in terms of snake bites uh, across the world so yeah i think there's an awful lot there and i think there was there was a, a difference um from what everyone else was interested in which kind of took me down that path um and then also international travel which really stapled that passion into something that was possible and i think once you actually get close to an animal and once you you can see it up front uh, and have an interaction with something it it will embed something in you different to any kind of good photo or image or zoo experience when you're actually there um it just hits you and it makes it um, impossible to forget, I think. Because you're, you're from the UK and the UK, I would say, you know, doesn't have many snakes run, running around. Uh, running around is probably not the right word to describe them. <laughs> 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 so in terms of your younger years, when you were sort of getting into it, was it sort of traveling abroad or was it just sort of looking at them in books and on tv was it that sort of path that sort of took you down in this sort of love affair with them yeah i mean i think um if you are growing up in the uk and you're interested in reptiles and people will say and rightly say that the uk has a fantastic range of reptiles which we do um but they are not as cool as exotic reptiles for me um they're not as medically significant um they're maybe not as pretty or most or as diverse or as big or as a very small subset um and so yes that i spend my childhood trying to pick um and catch thousand grass snakes or um common adders which are the uk's any venomous snake yes um are venomous snakes quite significant like absolutely um it's the only animal i think that's put steve backshaw in hospital as a uk common adder um, so they, they really are interesting in terms of how potentially significant they can be. Um, but in terms of what stoked my passion, um, it, it wasn't actually domestic reptiles at all. I think like most of us, we grew up watching really great personalities uh, on television. So the likes of um, Steve Irwin, um, even a bit more theatrical, maybe Austin Stevens, an African guy. And of course, um, UK, we have Marco Shea. 
um, who remains a bit of an idol to me now and is doing more kind of purposeful herpeto herpetological work um, in his in his current position at University of Wolves. So um, it was really television, uh, I think, which captured captured me as a child. I think most children are captured by that. And then as I got a little bit older, maybe I don't know six to six to ten books became more relevant, and of course not literature as such more great photos uh, and imagery books um snakes i mean for example i remember what there's one photo in this uh, in a book that i've got at home uh, i think it's one of mark's original snakes of the world books and there's a picture in there um of a west african gaboon viper i don't know whether you've seen one of these before john but essentially they're this massive viperid species they have the longest fangs of any snake in the world they're sort of they can get up to sort of seven foot six foot long massively fat they have a head like a labrador and there's this photo um of it in this kind of swamp land in in western africa i come just looking at this photo and thinking like there's no way that's actually an animal that that that, that just looks so uncomparable you know i have nothing to position that against um and I think that that sparked a real energy. Uh, it sparked kind of real. I haven't seen one yet. It's kind of on the bucket list, but um, it's it sparked a lot of other travel. Um, I think it's quite a poignant moment as well. I mean, obviously, to work with snakes, it's important to point out that you don't have to handle them. Um, in fact, some of the most effective kind of people that I've ever seen working with snakes very rarely get that hands on. Um, just through understanding the body language uh, of a snake, you can position it and work within it a way. And so that, you know, even if you're working with one of the world's most deadly snakes, it's completely safe. Um, you don't actually have to get that close. But, you know, when you're a child, I think people want to, you know, feel more of a real connection to something. And I, you know, I, I do like um, handling, handling the snakes in a safe way. But of course, I can't, can't wait to get my kind of hands on and feel that relationship. And when I was, I think, nine, I went to my parents who are not really animal people. They definitely uh, aren't familiar with reptiles. Um, and I said, well, you know, guys, I, I really either want my first snake or I want a PlayStation. Um, and <laughs> and they were so against me having a PlayStation. They bought me my first snake. I think they thought it was a bit of a fad. Oh, this will happen for a few years. It's a thing. And then it'll move on. Um, you know, and then 14 years later, I'm sat here talking to you about um, following a career and talking about snake conservation and human snake conflict. So maybe not a fad after all. <laughs> Well, great fad as it is. And so with um, with this adventure that you did, what I suppose because you're still at university studying, was it very much this trip was planned for when you were at school in terms of you had this idea and you were keen to pursue it or was this something sort of done through the university? I think for me, I guess just closing the gap between 10 and uh, where I was taking this trip, which was at the end of my undergraduate degree at University of York, I had been amazingly lucky um, to, to kind of be exposed to a lot of international travel uh, in the tropics to work with snakes. And I think that um, at the risk of maybe overstepping the mark, there are always opportunities to go and work with animals. Um, there are always ways, in, from my perspective, of maybe raising the funds to go, whether it's through amazing grants or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, for me, I got very lucky, you know, hands up. Um, I had people in my life that were um, traveling to places like that and I could tag along and learn from. Um, and so by the age of kind of 21, I've been to Sri Lanka a large number of times, which is obviously where I learned most of my um, venomous uh, snake interaction skills. Um, and then from that, I, I used that as a chance to get to Bali and work kind of conserving king cobras uh, in Bali for a good period of time with the Bali reptile rescue um, and then manage the kind of the capture and release of these large African rock pythons in South Africa with Kinyonga Reptile Center. And all of these things are fascinating to me. And I was building up, in my mind, experience with not just different species, because that is one thing. Whenever you're dealing with snakes, it's only ever a problem because they meet humans. So actually, you have to really consider how are you working with the human as well? And I was picking up different cultural skill sets. Um, but the the big area, the obvious area for me to go to being the Amazon, you know, about how cool snakes and reptiles are there in general. And I'd never been to South America. Um, and I've been really slaving away from my undergrad. My, my parents never went to university. Um, and so when I, when I went to uni, I was kind of so concerned that I would be the world's biggest failure that I ended up just, you know, working a 
really, really hard and, and kind of putting that above social things. I still played hockey and had fun and went out, but it was it was a work thing. And so when I got to the end of my three years, I was thinking, well, what kind of celebration um, could I have? What kind of trip could I do to christen at uh, the end of the first period um, of, of kind of my academic um, career in that sense? And for me, it was I'm going uh, to the Amazon in some shape or form. And if I'm going, I don't want to just go and do a trip that everyone else would do because no one's really going to care about snakes. And this is where I guess it's important to bring in my previous experience because I, I developed a real level of confidence, but really arrogance in terms of I know what I need to go and how I need to get there to have an experience that I actually want. And I can remember going kind of searching up Guyana as being the least traveled country in South America. It has some of the most untouched jungle, part of the Guyana Shield, like a real this this is the place to go and find cool stuff. And I was looking, are there any cool pre-planned trips, adventure, setup or whatever? Um, and I just couldn't find any that um, I thought were interesting to me because um, it's expensive to go and it was going to be like a once of a lifetime. I mean, I've also stuck down the barrel of going back to work in London as a management consultant. Um, so it was a bit of like a, I really want to make this a special trip that I, that I, if it doesn't all work out, that I'll remember forever. And I can remember just going to the local cafe, printing out a map of Guyana and circling things and just drawing lines between bits that I wanted to go and do different habitats, different environments, different people, different species targets. Um, and that's kind of how the how the trip went up. It was very much a read of I think the only travel guide written in Guyana is still the last published date was 2014 or something. So it's you know amazingly out of date. So like emailing all emails with their automatic replies on, and then there's no phones. Um, and it's just ultimately a lot of human trust. Um, and I guess being relevant, um, I remember when we're thinking about traveling through Guyana and how you'd make it through all of these red pens. Initially, we thought, well, we'll just rent some kind of a four by four uh, and just drive it. Um, and then a bit more reading, you realize actually that road in wet season is is partially a river. So well, that's not going to be a thing. That's not possible. So immediately you're like, well, am I going to have to hire a plane? Like, what does that look like? And because, you know, in the way that we think about hiring a plane, it's only the Bond villains that would do that. Um, how does a uni student hire a plane? Turns out in Guyana, it's like hiring a plane is the least fun thing that you did that day. Like, you just call up a guy and say, I want to get here. And he says, oh, we fly on ABC date. The price is X, Y, Z. Um, book it and go. So a lot of book it and go um, kind of, I guess, energy there as well. Wow. And this was this was your first big sort of a adventure into the sort of jungle and the yeah. ju the jungles like an incredibly hostile sort of place at times especially for the sort of uninitiated or the unprepared how did you sort of prepare for it well it, it was it was a weird one for me because i felt like with years spent kind of in sri lankan jungles balinese jungles um I was kind of aware, and I, I use that kind of really honestly because I don't think anyone can say I've been to one jungle, I can do them all. Um, I think if you're lucky enough to have jungle experience, you know that they're all unique. Um, the time of year makes them unique, their habitat makes them unique, the different plants and the way that you find value in a jungle, which is everywhere, uh, is unique. But my my real preparations didn't really think about me. I also took for the first two weeks uh, one of my best friends from university. And he'd only ever been on holiday kind of uh, in Central Europe with his family before. And I remember him saying, oh, I really want to come on the trip. And I'm saying to him, well, you know, I promise you that for the first two weeks of the trip, which is what he stayed for. And then I went deeper and he went home. You know, you'll you'll see amazing things. This will be a proper trip. Um, but here's a, here's a list of things uh, to buy and here's a list, list of kind of you know, realities that are going to happen. And so most of my thoughts were about how I can plan it for Will, how, like, how we can kind of make it fun, how we can make it, importantly, make it safe. Um, and I think when you're thinking about trips sort of um, like this, really remote, you, you're not near hospitals, you are two, three days away. It's not about, oh, I've fallen over, I've cut myself don't worry guys I'll just go back and I'll get myself sorted because that's just not how it works in reality you're ultimately stopping a uh, a proper trip um you're stopping uh, an expedition so it's selfish uh, to get injured essentially um so there was so much planning around how we could bubble wrap everyone ultimately on this trip which we were surrounded by pointy things stinging things and biting things uh, and move from there so 
I, I had an amazing moment of realization when actually I landed in Guyana and I planned to do this documentary as a chance to credentialize myself to do a career or something that I really cared about, which was what ultimately storytelling uh, about snakes and about their environments. And I realized that I had a new camera. I was kind of figuring out what shutter speed and aperture was on the plane over. Uh, I bought a new microphone that I hadn't even plugged in. Um, and I hadn't even considered what I'd be like in the jungle. I mean, things hit your head like, are you going to be any good? Like, I don't know. Um, and I can remember holding the camera in front of my face, trying to do an opening segment for a travel. I just felt like the world's biggest asshole. You know, like you, you're going somewhere as very, I mean, also I don't really blend in uh, in the tropics, you know, I'm a white guy with red hair. Uh, I am a tourist. Uh, there's kind of no way of um, blending in and, and, and feeling like a local. And so when you're surrounded by local guys or, and girls who live in that environment, and you're talking about their world, they're all looking at you like, what do you have to say about this place? Get us on the camera. And in many ways, they're right, actually. And, and I, I really tried to get them on camera as much as humanly possible. But whether it was embarrassment or, you know, um, English speaking skills, that didn't end up happening. But you, you do really have to... Um, think about what you want to achieve in your own skill set. I definitely overlooked that um, and probably in the planning and the planning of others and had to just kind of whip through and learn through and make mistakes uh, of which there were just many, um, fortunately small, but many mistakes. I think when you sort of start recording, you know, your trips and adventures and, you know, uh, put yourself in front of the camera, it's incredibly difficult and actually it takes so much practice. I remember first starting and, you know, I would speak, you know, I'm sure people are like, well, you're, you're terrible now, so I wouldn't even worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, when I first started, I just remember looking at myself and I think I sent to a friend, he's like, my God, just, you know, you're here. And I was like, I, I think it was a trip across Europe and I was sort of st- almost starving myself so I wasn't in the best frame of mind in terms of if you're hungry you don't exactly want to be like hey I'm so excited to be here because uh, you're just hungry and you just brings you straight down and already you're quite slightly depressed and he was just like my god you look just miserable and I was like well I was kind of miserable <laughs> it was authentic but that's the thing it's actually portraying that and as you say when you went out and it's also knowing what you want to shoot because otherwise you are just shooting for the sake of shooting, thinking, oh, I'll get that and then I'll go back to it. I mean, I still have so much footage from one of my trips and I was just shooting for the sake of shooting. And then unless you know exactly what the story, you, I mean, the story can change, but knowing exactly what story you want to set out, you will just constantly have your camera be like, oh, that looks cool. Oh, that looks cool. But actually you are, what's the word? you're just shooting aimlessly and then you get back and you're like, mm, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. I think there's that, there's that phrase, isn't there? I was kind of conscious about it when I went in the jungle um, called being a busy fool, um, whereby you're constantly shooting and constantly talking and it feels like, Oh, I'm the man. Da, 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 da. But actually you're, you're kind of getting nothing because you're, you're missing the point. You're not answering the question. Um, and it's tough because you set your own question. So when you see something that's amazing and doesn't fit your question, you're thinking, well, maybe I can just shift it. If you're going to adapt it. And sometimes you can. And I think that's probably a good thing, you know, like having a flexible scope where you can, something amazing pops out. I mean, I hadn't planned to find a harpy eagle on the trip and we found one on week three. And so that became an interesting thing to talk about because it's so incredibly rare. Um, and if you have too tight a scope, then you'd, you'd miss that out. But too loose and people don't actually know what you're talking about. Like, what's the point of the whole documentary? And if I'm being really honest, I probably had a bit of that. Um, I think most people it's probably even professionals still have that um because if if you are being the presenter the producer the director the cameraman um, and the dog's body you know all of those hats you're just wearing too many um and, and all your ideas get blurred and mixed and you get frustrated and then when you add in things like as you say i'm hungry i haven't slept um i'm getting bitten by every single living thing in the jungle um my mate isn't having a very good time so i'm miserable i haven't found any snakes i'm staring down the barrel of the gun of being a complete failure um all these things happen which make you just a bit um, well that's the that's the amazing bit i think actually about expeditions um it's how how kind of well you deal with um things going wrong and rolling with the punches 
um, because you definitely do get hit in the face. Yeah, it's very true. Because in the jungle, you are going at sort of in 30 degree heat, almost 100% humidity. And that brings up many problems in terms of not being able to dry your clothes and you get this sort of I don't know what the technical term is, but rot in sense. Your skin is just constantly wet, so it starts to yes. rot away in a sense. Uh, how did Will and yourself sort of deal with that for the two? Well, the first is, the two weeks that Will and yourself yeah. were there. This is a like this. This is a very direct question. I should probably go and chat to Will before <laughs> and this goes out <laughs> because it involved me probably embarrassing him and probably talking about an area of slight scuffle between both of us um but i guess there are a number of things to talk about here another you know a number of root important pieces so number one if you are traveling as two what i don't know young 20 year olds both guys it doesn't have to be both guys but it's probably um more applicable like you, you both want to feel like you're the expedition leader um and it's a bit of well oh, don't tell me what to do because i'm my own Blah, 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 blah. and i know that you've got all these plans but i'll, I'll manage me and you manage yourself um and you just can't afford to do that really uh, in the jungle uh, i know that we'll have bad feet in any case uh, he is a big runner uh, and so that his feet um are an area of weakness for him when it comes to resilience over kind of performance um and for the first two weeks we were traveling from the northeast to the southwest we went basically staying at research centers one in the jungle one in um, and kind of the, um, on the periphery of the jungle where the jungle meets the savannah. So a nice kind of hybrid habitat, um, in kind of the floodplains and then down right into deep savannas. And we're always staying somewhere with a, with a roof for the first two weeks. Um, and I think that it's very easy to make a mistake that even though you feel like you're in a home or you feel like you're in civilization, actually, if you zoom out, you're in the middle of a jungle that's in a man built house and all of the rules apply that if you're also staying in the middle of the jungle that I did two weeks later. So um, powdering kind of armpits, um, private areas, things that will rub every night, feet, critical. Don't do that. You get splits and you can't walk. If your feet go, then you have to go home. That's kind of in short um, what happened to Will uh, after two weeks. Um, and if, if you don't if you do not do it, it kind of ruins the trip as well. I mean, I think I answered the question a while ago, um, which says, oh, who could do a jungle expedition i'm kind of well anyone can do it i mean um yes there's a certain base level fitness required there's a base level mental resilience required there's a base level interest required and then the time available which sounds silly but i think is actually amazingly relevant because it takes so long to plan one of these things to do it properly um but for me why would you want to go and do this if you didn't really love it you know i mean like what the jungle is a horrible place to be uh, if you don't want to be there um (laughs) And it's my favorite kind of environment on earth. But unless I love snakes, I wouldn't be there. I'd be by the beach. Like, you're joking. Like, it's fucking horrible. <laughs> um, so unless you've got a real reason why, I can't think of anywhere worse to be. And I think, you know, with us going through that early stage in terms of managing um, what, what the environment will do to you, um, there was a couple of, like, brothers who fight syndrome going on. Um, but previous experience for me, I, I, I knew... Uh, I knew the realities. And even if your skin doesn't feel that wet, you follow the same procedure, back through, keep really, really clean. And I think that's another misnomer about the jungle. People say, oh, you must be dirty the whole time. And like in many ways you are, like in many ways you're completely filthy. Um, but in other ways, you know, the importance of keeping clean is absolutely paramount. You know, if, if you've got a cut and you are crawling with crap, then you're in big, big trouble because um, infection just happens at a cataclysmically faster rate than it would do as normal. Um, and um, mosquito bites, if mosquitoes start biting your feet and they come red raw, you combine that with um, kind of loose skin and splitting and you combine that again with like muddy ground and maybe your boots start, you know, leaking a bit. I mean, it sounds like hell, doesn't it, really? Um, but the truth is if you, if you prepare yourself properly, it's, it's, it's amazing fun. It's amazing fun. And where do I sign up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. At the, at the end of a very short queue, I think is the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so Will had to sort of go after the sort of two weeks. Was that yeah, I mean, Will, by Will choice? For, or... um, 
or was that Will always going to, go. to? Oh, he had to go. Yeah, so, so Will only had two weeks of a break from work. Um, he was working in London uh, again uh, in banking as I was working in banking. And he, he was always going home after two weeks. But I think in reality, um, I think he, he, he was kind of done. Um, he, I don't think, could have gone two more weeks um, without any of the comfort. Um, properly into the bush. I mean, we, for the for the next two weeks, we just had hammer. We didn't take any food, any water. It was just you know pure survival stuff. And everything that you learn in the first two weeks became amazingly real. Um, he, there's no way we could have done that. He'd have to gone home. His feet. He couldn't walk um, towards the end. Um, he was missing out on on amazing trips. Um, missing out on nighttime snake walks, early morning snake walks, afternoon snake walks. You get the theme that snakes are important to the trip. But um, quite a few snakes. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few, but um, yeah, he, he was always going to go home, but um, would have had to have gone home anyway, for sure. So in Guyana, in the jungle, I think for people listening, what sort of reptiles were you seeing? You know, you you hear about these giant anacondas, these Goliath triantulas, which are horrendous when you see them. I mean, they are so big and they're a thing of nightmares. Um, what, what sort of, uh, insects and reptiles were you seeing on a daily basis? Well, I think uh, this is a really important point because I think people talk about the Amazon and they think, well, as soon as you go in, you'll see all the stuff. And the truth is I spent the month turning over every single rock, every leaf, shimmering up every tree and found relatively little. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for this. Like, the first being sensationalism of the jungle. I think we're very good at that. Um, you know, kind of in the West, in terms of if you go to the jungle, there's always massive spiders and massive snakes. And do, do they live in there? Yes, they do. Green anaconda, you know, my main reason for going was to find the, the world's heaviest bodied snake. Um, Goliath, birdie and tarantula, did I want to find um, the world's biggest tarantula? Yeah, 100%. That'd be amazing. They're actually amazingly docile um, as well if you can position your interaction properly. Um, a whole host of other snakes, like Savannah, South America's most deadly snake, um, the Ferdelants. I mean, fortunately, I say that ironically, but fortunately, found a few of those, which was amazing. Um, then, obviously, the Bushmaster, I mean, biggest snake in the Western Hemisphere, and they call it the silent death uh, in the jungle, because if you get hit by one of those, you're not getting hit by anything else. Um, and a whole host of other things, then bullet ants. I mean, that... I, I, Number one on the list of how to ruin your day is being bitten on the ass by a bullet and you know, no one wants that to happen. So so there are a whole whole host of things. But I think the truth is, and one thing that I'm really keen to communicate is you can go into the jungle and absolutely see none of these things um, and whilst trying to look for them. Um, I was absolutely forced to go in the worst time of year to find anything cool, which is wet season. Um, so my uni degree finished um, in May, May, June time, uh, and I was starting a job as management consultant in London in September, um, which left me with approximately three months to try and film something that could hopefully change my career uh, and, and realize a dream uh, talking about this weird stuff. So you're, you're pigeonholed into a three month window where it's all rain. Um, and when it's all rain, it's tougher for you to be there uh, because it's miserable. Um, all the ground is muddy, infection risks are much higher, uh, the water is dirtier, um, things are harder to find. Because if you, if you think about um, the way that the jungle works, it's kind of, I guess, in one way, very obvious, the other one quite counterintuitive. Uh, if there's lots of water, you're thinking everything's going to be out, especially from a reptile perspective, being active, maybe there's, there's breeding going on, maybe there's a lot more frogs around, and so that would encourage... Um, predators to be a bit more active towards frogs but the, the kind of the truth is in something like the amazon which is all kind of fairly low level where we were if water uh, is rising then the habitat for the things you're looking for is increasing and so there is a bigger space with which these same animals can live and it becomes harder and harder to find them because they just live all over the place by contrast, going in the dry season, where you know water is the single source of life um, in the jungle, things will congregate to the water. You don't have to look for them. You look for the big water and then wait for them to turn up, and it definitely happens. Um, so you can go into the jungle uh, and never find never find a thing. Um, but if you're really lucky, uh, you can come across um, some of the world's most amazing snakes, uh, which is definitely the reason why we went there. God, incredible. We we had Lucy Shepherd on the podcast and when she was describing about Bushmaster snakes, 
it was her sort of experience of them you could just tell the sort of fear that she had when she heard that sort of whistling sound coming on it was one of complete fear and just the way that she described it that whistling sound was just on another level snakes and trips um that's the that's the critical piece if you're bitten by a snake in the jungle and it's you know the bushmaster or third lance and it you know it's a it's a venom bite it catches you um in flesh then that's the end um definitely of the trip um and you know with potentially much more significant ramifications for life of course um and I mean, we were really unlucky, quote unquote, to not find uh, a Bushmaster because I I looked high and low, mostly low being terrestrial snakes, but high and low in the um, active sense. Um, And I think this is kind of where it's interesting um, being in a jungle expedition space, but also being uh, a snake um, guy is you you in some ways it's hugely beneficial because all all of the fear around snakes you can you can manage i mean if snakes wanted to bite us we'd all be dead uh in 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 short i mean india wouldn't be a thing um there's so many snakes there and if they all had they've all they're all medically significant um sri lanka wouldn't be a thing there's no antivenom really in sri lanka i mean snakes don't want to um kill humans you know they can't eat us so what's the point um, so they, they will look to hide from us at every given opportunity. Now, of course, in the jungle, it's slightly different where you are going right into their habitat. You're, you're walking through all of um, their spaces. Uh, and, and I think the truth is, well, is what Will said to me when he first came into the jungle. He was like, I can't believe how, how dirty it is. Like, you know, I think Western perception of the jungle is that the, the jungle floor is, is quite easy to see in comparison to where the, the, the trees and the bushes start. Um, but definitely in wet season, there's a good two foot of foliage. Um, and the truth is snakes like to burrow. Um, they get preyed on a lot by birds. And so you could be walking through a uh, big open space, foliage, you walk through a um, nice little foot of gap and there could be a bush master in there and it hits you on the foot. And there's no, no matter how good you are with snakes, there's no way of protecting it. Um, so I, I, I can totally understand Lucy's kind of, um, I guess, trepidation uh, about coming into conflict um, with a bush master. And, it's something I hadn't really considered because we had a couple of guides. Well, I had a couple of guides um, to help carry bags uh, and, and support on the trip for the last two weeks. And we made it really clear at the start of the trip that the reason why I was there um, was to go and find snakes. And the number one rule in the jungle is no one goes alone to do stuff because you get lost. Uh, if you get lost in the jungle, I mean, I wouldn't wish on anyone, um, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I think everyone who lives there has a period of being lost for a few days. Um and oftentimes it doesn't end very well. Um, sometimes it, you know you, you come back, tell a story, you never ever do it again. Um, and so when we were out in the jungle and I wanted to go out on late night snake walks or early, early morning snake walks, because most of the cool stuff there is nocturnal. So that's really how you might find target species like green anaconda, fertilance, bushmaster. Um, the guys were you know, really hesitant to actually come. Uh, they're like, well, actually, I don't want to go. I'm going to stay here. We'll keep look at the fire or we'll keep look at the camp or whatever. And I found myself in a really weird place where at, at the time, and I think it's, it's important to reflect on this, like no food, no water, haven't found too much, pissed off, hungry, tired, all the rest of it. I found myself getting really, really frustrated um, is the honest truth. Uh, and I wasn't the best version of myself. Um, I'd normally I'm quite a holistic uh, thinker and consider it for people, um, which I think is really important for jungle expedition. In fact, probably more so than any other kind. But I mean, I, the, the, the tension was building so much. Um, but then I remember when we had this particular one night where we were out on the water, because um, one thing that you can find uh, in wet season quite well are the arboreal snakes. So snakes that live in the trees. So your Amazon tree boas being probably the number one snake that we found on the trip. We, you, you guarantee a sighting every single night. They're non-venomous, they're, they're between three and six foot, fairly skinny, nice, great big teeth, which is fascinating to have a look at. And there are some photos that I can share afterwards of those teeth. Um, we were along on the river, we had an old aluminium boat and we're kind of chugging along. Uh, we saw a big snake in the tree. I said, let's pull over here. I'll just quickly get it down, have a quick look. Um, and I think I saw it had a bit of a busted jaw. So I wanted to go and see if we could just do something to maybe help a little bit uh, with, it, with, with the snake. And it was amazingly uh, defensive. Um, was kind of really um, biting, was unhappy. Um, and then 
this is so normal um, for kind of most snakes that you might find at night. They're out hunting, you're coming at them, you've got a big torch on, it's all, I mean, imagine it'd be the most terrifying thing if you're a snake, but you can calmly interact with them. And I remember we, we had this good exposure, I was calmly interacting with the snake, calmly pulled it off, calmly had it um, behind the head because it was d- distressing for the snake to have been free handled. Um, and all the guys were on the boat, the two, you know, Damien and Harry, who were the names of the two guides. And when they saw that interaction, and then they saw the snake relax, because we were all relaxed. And then they had a nice, you know, I let them hold the snake. We spoke about the snake. Um, we spoke about what it means to their culture, what, you know, why I was interested in it. Um, we had a complete momentum shift um, in the whole trip. Um, it seemed like suddenly they were interested uh, in finding more and I couldn't tell whether that was because they suddenly had confidence in me um, which is a thing Uh, I think you know they must see lots of people coming in um, from the UK or the US or non-native people reckoning they're you know good snake people and they see why it's all a bit spooky and it's a bit um, you know uh, non-calm and unplanned but for us I think maybe they saw that in me that it was going to work well um, that we had a calm and consistent approach to interacting with potentially dangerous animals, um, or whether it was because they'd actually never seen one or wanted to see one up close uh, in a, you know, with a purpose of just understanding uh, and interacting with. Um, but after that, it was like, I couldn't, I couldn't keep them down. I mean, it was, oh, we think that we might have better luck if we maybe go this way up the river. And I'm thinking, yes, energy, like 100%, <laughs> let's go. Um, I trying to hold them back whenever I found a snake. They were getting so close that before I was saying, well, you can come a bit close. And they're standing like 10 meters away. You can come a bit closer to kind of see and uh, learn from the specifics. And towards the end, it was like, well, guys, you're quite close. Like, these <laughs> things do go from zero to 100 very quickly. And um, I think that was that was great for me because, yes, we that helped us find snakes. More people uh, make lighter work. But, I mean, even irrespective of the project, um, I care about breaking down misconceptions around snakes. Um, and I think maybe that's quite easy to do with people in the UK who don't face a very real and very negative um, interaction with snakes, often quite regularly. But if you can change the opinion of someone who, I mean, as I found out later, um, nearly lost their life to a snake bite, um, and people in the village die annually from snake bites, if you can change their opinion or at least spark an interest or, you know, maybe challenge an assumption. I mean, you, you, that speaks to real power. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I won't forget that uh, interaction. And I think that's really what's inspiring a lot of the work that I'm doing now and the work that I'm hoping to do uh, going forward. Yeah, it's, it's sort of um, giving them an under, giving people an understanding of, of what you do, really. And that's why it sort of matters so much of... Because I imagine people listening to this podcast, I would probably say 50%, probably more, would be terrified if this, they saw a snake come into their house. In fact, I'd say it's way higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon that's way higher. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's the fun thing about snakes is because um, I would look at that exam question as a hugely positive thing. Um, because if you're afraid of something or if you're interested, you know, excited by something, snakes have a unique ability to interest people. I mean, I think that it's quite rare that you, you, you'd find someone impartial to snakes. You know, they're either on one camp or the other. And if you're on one camp or the other, then you are exerting feeling towards a thing. Um, so kind of talking about them, uh, I think it's quite great in terms of getting an audience. I mean, a number of times I'm at dinner and we end up talking about snakes because even if people are terrified or really interested, like it, it sparks conversation and people find it interesting. Um, and in terms of a snake coming into your house, I, I think that probably is scary actually. Um, <laughs> um, I think like one of the reasons they're kind of working with snakes that I quite enjoy. Um, and maybe this actually goes back to before. So I'll kind of go slightly off, off tranche and talk about something slightly different. But when I was learning about how to interact with snakes in Sri Lanka, um kind of dealing with snakes there it's not like a, a job uh, it isn't a single person who would set up a shop and go and do a thing it's like an obligation um per region a family takes on the ownership of uh, of managing and um, capturing of snakes from someone's house or from their farmland and it, it, it's a very tight community it's passed down generally from father to son and uh, so forth uh, and so i went to to this local um 
sort of they call them snake doctors but i mean essentially it's like your local snake conservationist and i said listen i'm, I'm really interested in learning more uh, about handling these snakes and of course you you say things like that when you're younger because you you want to get the cool photos i mean if you search hard enough uh, on my instagram there are photos I'm not particularly proud of um, in terms of putting out there for the whole world to see, like handling cobra with just your bare hands. I mean, when you're young, it's exciting and it, you're pushing the limits and you're pushing the boundaries. But, you know, that might inspire reckless behavior and therefore expire, you know, inspire problems. And that, that's the opposite of what anyone wants to do. It's the opposite of definitely what I want to do. But I think when I went there and I said I want to handle the snake, I was very quickly put in my place, uh, which was amazing. Um, you had the kind of the chance to do that and he said you know you're not touching any snakes until you understand their behavior and i thought i did understand behavior i mean i as we said i've had snakes of my own my whole life um i'm a complete um you know addict in terms of watching um, interactions whether it be youtube or public documentary or film or however it's trying to transcribe and he said listen you know if you're going to do this here you have to really switch on to body uh, to, to body behavior uh, and my favorite species of snake in the whole world uh, is the spectacle cobra, uh, the true cobra, Naja Naja. Um, and they have diurnal eyes, um, big sort of round pupils. And that makes them interesting to work with because they have an extra sort of sense. As, and we all know that snakes have got generally bad eyesight. And on a relative scale, that's true. Um, but some snakes have better eyesight than others. Um, and in, in this case, these round pupils, um, they, they do pick up. Um, images and shadows and uh, it, it sparks their attention so actually when when you see um you know someone like me picking up a venomous snake uh with their hands you should look at it and say this is probably coming from insecurity and it's you know probably the wrong thing for them to be doing but another takeaway would be uh, was probably the reason why i did it actually was um you, you you can manipulate their body language if you really understand their behavior you can do this uh, it is also i think for me that the pinnacle of understanding uh, a snake is when you can have a quote unquote safe interaction in an entirely reckless and dangerous fashion. Um, and of course, there are some snakes where you can kind of do that with, and I might argue you shouldn't do it with any. And then there are some which, in my mind, you definitely shouldn't do it with because they are amazingly unpredictable. And that would probably go for a long line of viperid species nocturnal, very erratic, heat sensing pits. It is impossible to know exactly what they're going to do. But within a certain scope, you can really see behavior uh, and so when kind of coming across these snakes in the jungle flipping back to the application um it makes the interaction really safe um and if you can make the interaction really safe but feel very real for people um i think that's what inspires new perspective and i when talking about snakes there's often a lot of false information put out about snakes because it's um it's sort of myth based uh, like snakes chasing you, uh, which which doesn't happen uh, really, unless in a very small, uh, rare subset of interactions. Um, equally, kind of, um, I mean, people have a whole list of snakes. I mean, from working in Africa, I think I've heard all uh, of, of of the local tales about snakes. Um, but for me, that like the, the most important thing to kind of really um, pull out. Um, from kind of a snake interaction is not to really tell people which is really counterintuitive um because if something is real for them then it is real in that sense and i think where a lot of people in my shoes might go wrong and there are people much better than me at doing this i'm sure but i'd say oh no that's not how to think about it we think about it like this um and that has some value because you're offering a different perspective but the truth is, if they really believe something, no matter how ridiculous it sounds to you, you have an obligation to treat that as real um, for me. And so what I'll try not to do is say, oh, that's wrong and this is how you think about it, but show them something which would lead them to suggest that their assumptions are incorrect. You know, don't tell them that it's hot, take off your coat, just show them that it's warm and they'll take it off by themselves. I think, you know, to achieve real change, that that's where we have to sit. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying to show to Damien and Harry on the boat was, you know, you can think what you'd like about snakes, but here's a case study that might force you to just at least think about what your assumptions are all by yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 amazing. And as I say, for for people listening, it's been an incredible sort of story that you've sort of done over the years in 
trying to change sort of behavior and assumptions about snakes? It's quite, it's, it's interesting because on two hands, you could say it's either a big problem or not really an issue at all. You could say that um, for the number of snakes on planet Earth, that the, the likelihood of having a, a, a bite or a fatal interaction is nigh on zero. Um, and that's kind of true, you know, um, no party wants the interaction. Um, you're not, you're not going, most people aren't going out looking for them. So that, that's generally fair. Uh, on the other hand, of course, um, if you happen to live in a rural community across the tropics where snakes are more likely to come into your house, even if it is unlikely at a sheer size of audience, you are going to get a gross number. Um, and 130,000 people each year die of venomous snake bite. I mean, that's so significant. I mean, I remember looking at the news earlier this year with regards to coronavirus deaths. Uh, and I think, we, you know, the right action is one death is not just a single number. It, you know, the impacts are huge. Like I remember thinking in the UK where we were having all these cases uh, and deaths and it was getting to about 30,000 and politicians were talking about how this was the end of the world and all of our resources should be going into this to change it. And they were right. And, you know, what an amazing job all of that was. But with 130,000 deaths happening each year in snakes and having no change been really been seen over previous years, I can't help but think that this is a ginormously neglected area of real importance. And of course, when people look at the snakes and they say, oh, well, it's super unlikely and it kills 130,000 people each year um, on the grand spectrum of a 7 billion population of the world, that's quite insignificant. Um, what they're also maybe not considering, and some do, but generally don't, is the people that they tend to bite tend to be rural workers in fields. They tend to be uh, the male of the house, which tends to be the breadwinner um, in the family structure. Now, if that person is bitten by the snake and dies, that's then no income coming in for their family, which has a thousand knock-on effects, which have huge emotional, financial um, safety considerations. But even if that person survives, I mean, it is very rare for someone to survive without a lasting physical wound. Maybe they lose a hand, maybe they lose the use of a hand, maybe they, whatever, it's their foot or something, they, maybe they, they then can't work in the field, they then lose an income, and then all this stuff. I mean, and we're in a wonderful position uh, in the UK that we're having so much attention on mental health. And that's a huge thing that, you know, I, I experienced really bad mental health in the jungle, um, which we can talk about in a sec. But, you know, we're at a level where we can really address those as significant concerns. We're not even talking about the mental health implications from being bitten by a snake. I mean, I can only imagine. Imagine going to work each day in a field where you don't know every foot position you take or every hand position you take. That could be your last day. And what if you actually survived a bite and you had to go back and work there in the exact same place with no prevention kit? I, I cannot understand why people aren't um, more interested in this. Uh, and more, you know, kind of more, more keen to prevent it. Um, and so I think that's that, that's a big level of interest for me, and that's what's driving a lot of the work. And my master's work next year is going to tackle exactly this in Sri Lanka. Yeah, I suppose I suppose for most people, it's it's sort of based around where these countries, where the problem is, because in quite a lot of countries like the UK, that probably isn't so much of a problem. Uh, but in places like Sri Lanka, Guyana, um, and where snakes are hugely prominent, then I suppose they probably need to tackle this more head on. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, so I agree with that. And it, and it is country on country. And, I'm, you know, it's not that the UK should be doing more to help what is maybe a, a very specific country problem. But in on the other hand, uh, as, as a potential devil's advocate to that, um, look at a country like Australia, you know, they have nine of the 10 most venomous snakes on the planet. Uh, and I think they register about one death per year, or maybe even less than that. Or I, I can't get the statistics, but it's almost like they've completely fixed the problem of human snake interaction, which is still a huge crossover. Um, and it's because they have an incredible anti-venom program, which is, I mean, a significant contributor to which is the, um, I think it's the Australian Reptile Park. I mean, unbelievable guys based near Sydney. They always have amazing infrastructure, um, airplanes which will fly on someone being bitten by deadly venom mistake in the middle um, of the desert in, in central Australia. 
Um, and there's a load of work on with regards to prevention and how to interact with snakes. I mean, I think even like Margot Robbie was talking about when she was young, having to deal with snakes coming into her house with, you know, with her mum or something. And there was a humorous incident with a python in the broom. But um, the point is, yes, maybe it's a Sri Lanka problem. Yes, maybe it's an India problem or Indonesia problem or actually maybe it's the whole of an Asia problem because or South America problem. But it is important for countries that have sussed this to, to share lessons learned. Um, and it's important even for countries like the UK, where we haven't got a problem like this, to offer a valuable outside perspective. Um, I mean, I'm a British guy, um, and I, I hope there are other um, British um, guys and girls watching this that um, you know feel inspired to have a go at trying to do their bit uh, and to help, and to help, help solving this. Um, you know, I really think that now one of the beauties of, of how small the world is, um, whether through technology, uh, is, is the potential for really cross-national and cross-capability solutionizing is is really there. And it's so important that we do that. Um, and so, yes, whilst it is maybe a national issue, um, maybe an international response would be the real solution. Yeah. Well, it's been... It's just been incredible listening to your stories and I can't thank you enough for coming on and sort of telling us all about it. I mean, there are some things, as you say, that you've brought up that I had absolutely no idea about. And uh, it's, no, no problem. it's certainly changed my sort of perspective on snakes and reptiles. And I'm sure a lot of people listening, it feels the same. Uh, but there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. Oh, great. Go on. Uh, with the first being on the sort of trips into the jungle, what's the one gadget that you always take with you? <laughs> it's going to sound ridiculous, but my diary. That's a good one. Um, I, being a storyteller, wanting to be a storyteller, I always feel like you're, you, you're hit by the problem of relativity. When you're in somewhere amazing for more than a week, everything becomes normal. Um, and the important pieces, the story to pick out and to reflect on and to remember will blend into, oh, well, this can't be interesting because we have piranha for lunch every day. So surely no one's going to want to care about that. And you come home and tell someone what you've been doing and the bottom half of their jaw falls off. And so for me, I think um, writing in my diary every single day when I'm there reflecting on the things that I've done in a fairly fact-based way, you haven't got to put on your opinion just, we did this and this and this. When you get home, you're thinking, oh, wow, actually, we, we really did do an incredible job. We faced some real novel challenges. Uh, and for me, I think I mentioned earlier, kind of with, with my mental health side of the things, I found myself in a place in the jungle where I wanted my whole life to get there. I wanted, I mean, I had posters of Green Anaconda, Ferdinand Lance, Bushmaster on my wall as a child. And then when I am there, I'm miserable. What's that about? Um, that's, that whole thing is totally ridiculous for me. I mean, thinking, you know, half of me is thinking, pull your socks up, get over yourself. It's just a little bit tough, just a bit hungry, a bit tired. And on the other hand, I'm thinking, well, this is actually a fantastic thing to reflect on. I remember writing about that and, and thinking about why and, uh, uh, and how um, and how that was impacting my behavior on things. So I think actually for me, a diary kind of keeps my head in check. And for me, you know, in the jungle, if you keep your head in check, uh, then you can find solutions to the other things. Amazing. What about your favorite adventure or travel book? Oh, a favorite adventure or travel book. Um, I, I actually hate reading, uh, which is, I know, ridiculous given that I'm at university and reading is a big part of what I do. Um, but, and that's also a bit kind of obvious in terms of beating down the drum. But one of the first books that I read front to back in about two days without stopping, I think it was Levinson Wood's first book about walking the Nile. Um, and whilst the trip's ultimately not successful in terms of a physical walk on the Nile because of the wars in South Sudan, um, the way in which he spoke about the the formulation of the project, um, which I thought was interesting from a management perspective, but also the doing and the hardship and the resilience blended in with like the realities and the people along with which you meet. And it's the people bit that I, I find incredible and I find it really uh, inspiring. And I've taken a lot of those lessons into tr the things that I try and document I'll always go somewhere and look for the snakes or go somewhere and look to hit a goal. But I'll always come home and talk about the people, um, which is always surprising for me. And I think probably surprising for my friends and um, having that written. And I think the Walk in the Nile book is now a bestseller and widely read. I mean, 
what a fantastic baseline to go from if you're interested in following a career in the space to learn from someone like Levinson is um uh, must be an amazing is an amazing experience um and, and kind of what an amazing book what did he sort of say about uh the people in when you go to these countries well i i think he has this long relationship with um with a guide that he has there um and i think most of us might think about um true expedition is doing it without a guide oh how could you call it real expedition if you're doing it with a guy who has all the answers um to local problems um and i think he breaks that down really well um and i, I i've forgotten um chap's name now um maybe it'll come to me in a second but they're going through the countries and really, you know, war-torn areas. I mean, historically, so like Rwanda now having an amazing recovery and, all, you know, through all these places. And yes, guys got all the solutions for, you know, how to navigate cultural, local, local cultural scenarios, um, how to maybe find uh, bush food. Um, obviously, extra strength is always valuable uh, on an expedition trip. But then... You also see Levinson's value coming through to the guide, and 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 together it's this this cross functional skill set, um, and there's this amazing interaction where I think the guide's meant to leave Levinson at a certain point, and he was meant to go for a stretch by himself or find a new guide. I forget now, um, but but they carried on going together, uh, and I think that's the power uh, of an expedition is when you know two people form this um, amazing bond through hardships and resilience i think i thought that was a really touching story nice uh why are adventures important to you i think adventures are important to everyone um i I, and i guess that the crux of that depends on your definition of what an adventure is um for me uh an adventure is testing something new essentially in whatever way that could be uh, and for me in Guyana, it was a new environment. Uh, it was new snake species. It was uh, new challenges in terms of jungle survival. Uh, and they're important for me because, well, the short answer is they enable me to grow. Um, I believe in uh, a growth mindset. Um, I think that we roll with the punches valuably. Uh, an adventure um, forces you to take some punches. Um, but equally forces you to roll with them um, because if you don't roll with them and you get stung with a strong punch to the face, you, you can't afford to sit down for too long. So I think it healthily puts you in a position uh, of growth within a scope of excitement. Uh, and I think that's that's how we should face challenges um, with optimism, good planning and energy. Very nice. Don't think you could have said it, said it any better. <laughs> uh, what about your favorite quote? One of my best friends from school, a uh, guy called Monty Scousel, uh, he's recently finished runner-up in the British Amateur Golf. Um, and, you know, he's the most amazing sportsman. I'm so lucky to have him as, as one of my best mates. And he had a lot of publicity uh, around his golf because, you know, unfortunately lost uh, the amateur at the end, beaten by great golfer and Laird Shepherd, um, but giving up a sizable advantage. Now, most people will um, take that really heavily and it will impact them for the rest of their life, maybe at least in the short term. Monty, with the strength of his character, uses it as a motivation. And he sent me this quote the other day, which uh, um, I think it's a Teddy Rose about the man, man in the arena. I won't recite the whole thing because A, I can't remember it, and, and B, it's about a paragraph long. Um, maybe you can Google it. Uh, and, and the crux of the, the quote is, um, you know, be the person in the arena. Uh, dare boldly and when things go wrong at least you you have gone somewhere where you want to go uh, and it's better to be that person uh, maybe someone sitting on the outside criticizing who won't know uh, what it feels to really be in that arena um, and, I, and I think that that puts a lot of things that I get concerned about into scope in terms of you know what does failure look like what are people's judgments or assessments or he won't get there or he's not this or that um, I think as long as I'm in my arena uh, then um, and play in the game that I want to play good things will will come out um, from that I think it's important that we play um, get off the sidelines um, and get involved so I think what a great quote to inspire engagement yeah that's a really good one uh, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these grand adventures what's the one thing you would recommend to people wanting to get started there are a number of things I mean you could approach that question a thousand different ways um, but I think to, to kind of 
hit it on the head. Really nail down your purpose. Um, I think for, for most things, if, if you have a really strong why, uh, and that's really clear for you, whatever that is, whether it's the perfect beach holiday or you want to find the world's biggest you know, constrictor or um, a thousand different other objectives, you know you really know your why, then you probably have a better idea of how you want to get there and what you want from it, who you want to work with, how much money you might need to raise, which is an important thing not to overlook, I think. Uh, and you might also just have the gumption to give it a go. Um, I mean, I can't tell you all of the times that on this trip, like I've completely failed at something and we didn't get a chance. It's been too quick and too much fun, but you, you have to maybe find send, send money up front to people um, and take a big leap of faith uh, in human behavior in an area of the world where you haven't got any phone signal. Um, you, you might have to compromise your security or safety um, criteria to kind of get somewhere where you really want to go. Um, but a lot of the time, um, all of these questions in whatever way they manifest themselves leaves you in a position where you have to make a decision. Uh, and decisions are often really difficult, um, even in you know the UK, where in the worst case now you can always call a friend and get some help. But a decision in the middle of nowhere uh, is, is massive. And if you have your purpose and if you have your why, um, for me, that often acts um, as a really good guiding principle for making my decisions. And whether that's a no, often more important than a yes, uh, my my why will get me there. Um, so really think about that why. Challenge, I think, yourself to make that as specific as possible, but, you know, maybe more directive than prescriptive. Um, and then um, there'll be other challenges, of course, but, but uh, you know, that should see you through, I think, um, going through those hurdles. Amazing. Finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you in your future expeditions or adventures? Well, I'm currently studying for my master's at University of Exeter um, down, down in Cornwall, the Penryn campus, which is an amazing place to study. Um, and next year, uh, I'm currently going out um, for funding for a three month expedition to Sri Lanka. Um, I think talking about snake bite prevention and managing that human snake conflict um there's a lot of talk about anti-venom um there's a lot of talk about how we would save someone after a bite but there's surprisingly little uh, conversation about how you can prevent them in the first place where preventatives are actually really effective and quite cheap um equally like with any kind of product design going back to my consultancy days you would you would never design i don't think a successful product by telling the consumer what they want you would always really go and, and listen from them and understand their specific problems i think they're often different to what um the the maker or the solutionizer would assume um so i'm, I'm traveling to sri lanka and i'll document all of this on my instagram um page um about going to these rural communities in Sri Lanka, um, interviewing the people who are, are facing this deadly interaction on a day-by-day -day basis, and really see where their problems sit. Um, do they happen at work? Is there a specific time of day? Is there a specific kind of problem? I mean, are they afraid? Are they not afraid? What are the solutions that they've tried to put in place before and haven't worked? For example, people would say, oh, why can't everyone just wear boots? Um, and I thought that was a fair assumption. And like, I bought a load of boots about five years ago and took them all out. And people didn't want to wear them because they would say, well, if I wear these, I'll get blisters every single day of my life. And if I don't, then I might get a snake bite once in the blue moon. So this speaks to the power of actually understanding what the user wants. So you save on energy, save on wasted capital, save on um, you know, a whole load of inefficiencies and actually deliver a real solution. So uh, you can follow me uh, on my Instagram page. Um, and hopefully there'll be um, some more conversations coming up soon. I'm also giving a talk for the World Extreme Medicine uh, Society in a few weeks time. And uh, I'll drop a link for that in my Instagram page as well. Amazing. Well, we'll put, put the link in uh, the description below for people listening. And Harrison, it's been such a pleasure listening to your stories. And I can't thank you enough for coming on today. No problems. Thanks so much, John. No worries. Well, have a great day and we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.